Good morning, everybody. Morning. 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 Thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'm really excited to kick off our 2019 trends discussion. Uh, CARA was actually the first media agency to launch a trends report, and we've got a really, really strong following of, of people that anticipate that report every year. Um, and been going for 10 years, and fantastic work by, by Dan over the last decade to establish that. Uh, and we're really, really pleased that Forbes has recently recognised us in their, in their school report for trends. So uh, thank you very much, Forbes, for that. Um, I was thinking this morning about how much has changed over the last 10 years as I was sitting on my train commuting into London and I was reminded that, you know, my social experience 10 years ago was my friends telling me they'd eaten a sandwich or they were in the pub. And fast forward 10 years to the experience that, that, that I got this morning, which is a beautifully curated experience of their lives and of the brands that they love. Um, so uh, what we're going to focus on this morning um, is, is that overarching trend of uh, expanding connectivity. Because really when we think about all the innovations that we've talked about over the last 10 years, connectivity is the one thing that has driven those innovations. And with 5G launching this year, um, we, we're really going to see an acceleration in that. You know, the experience is being delivered to consumers 20 times faster. As a media agency, the conversations that we're having with our clients, that has a big implication on that. So we've pulled together a panel for you this morning, and thank you to Instagram and Spotify for joining us. I'm going to leave, uh, leave Ben to introduce the panelists. Um, my last job is to talk about housekeeping. In the event of a fire, two fire exits there for the people in the room. Um, we are live streaming on Facebook, another example of expanded connectivity. We wouldn't have been able to do that 10 years ago, and welcome to everybody who's joined us on the feed. Uh, please don't swear. <laughs> A bit early in the morning, but please don't swear. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Ben Bland, who is our moderator. Ben is an experienced freelance presenter. He's presented a wide range of, of live programs from regular bulletins with BBC World News, BBC News Channel, and the World Service Radio. He's hosted a number of live events internationally. He was part of our event last year at, in Cannes, uh, where we hosted a panel with, with Visium. And he's done various Q&A sessions all over the world. His fun fact is that at the age of 21, he gained the, freedom of the, he gained the freedom of the city of London, which gives him the ancient right to drive a flock of sheep across London Bridge. So I think our panelists are in safe hands this morning. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> Thanks very much to uh, Fiona, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, we'll keep this flock in a you know in a, in a, in a coherent line. Um, uh, as we were hearing from Fiona, uh, the Trends 2019 uh, report marks the 10th anniversary of CARA doing its look ahead to the trends for the coming year. Uh, a very warm welcome to all of you here in the room, and a very warm welcome to you watching on the Facebook uh, live stream. Uh, we'd love you to get involved as we uh, have the discussion. There'll be time for questions and answers later. And also, if you are watching on the Facebook live stream, please put your questions in the comments. We'll pick out uh, some of those and, and put as many of them to the panel uh, as we can. Uh, we mentioned that uh, we heard from Fiona that uh, it's been reviewed by Forbes. Uh, in their words, a solid collection of fresh ideas that would benefit from a bit more information. So I'm hoping that's where you guys come in and flesh it out for us. Uh, if you do want to have a look at the report in detail, it is available. Uh, you can search for that online uh, as well. So let me introduce the uh, panellists who I'm delighted to say uh, have a wealth of experience uh, between them. At the far end, we have uh, Alex Underwood, who is uh, Vice President, Global Head of Strategic Partnerships and Verticals at Spotify. Uh, in that role, he drives relationships and partnerships with the world's leading brands uh, and agencies. Alex has been with Spotify since 2013. Uh, as its first, he was its first VP of East Coast Sales. Uh, leading the development of the company's uh, sales infrastructure on the east coast of the US uh, and its strategy there. Fun fact about Alex, uh, you may not know this, as, uh, as a member of Pig Bag, not Alex, but Alex's uncle, uh, Simon Underwood co-wrote the 1981 UK hit, Papa's Got a Brand New Pig Bag, charted at number three, kept off the top spot cruelly only by Paul McCartney and Stevie Wonder. Uh, next, to, uh, next to Alex we have Sean Healy. <coughs> Sean is the Global Chief Strategy Officer at uh, CARA. He brings over 20 years of senior experience, both in full service and media agencies. He's worked with brands such as L'Oreal, ST, Sky, Shell. Uh, and Sean leads CARA's global strategy team, currently working on various areas of product development 
such as helping clients identify where the emerging opportunities for growth are uh, and designing the experiences that they can offer uh, when the 5G world uh, really hits us. Fun fact about Sean, his early work experience involved plenty of uh, prestigious jobs overseas, perfect for working in a global media role. What kind of jobs? Cultivating melons in southwestern France, egg production in Israel, and selling fishing bait in Maryland, USA. Mm. Welcome to Sean. <laughs> uh, next to Sean, uh, we have Dan Calladine. Dan has worked within the media industry for more than 20 years. Uh, consultancies, technology companies, various agencies. For the past 10 years, he has written the Trends Report as part of his role at Cara Global. Uh, fun fact about Dan, uh, he's also an influencer. Got nearly 40,000 followers for his London Food Instagram account. So two points from that. One, if you're feeling peckish and want somewhere good to eat, check it out. And also, if you can get him to mention you, you'll probably pick up a few followers as well. Uh, next, to, uh, next, to, next to Dan, we have Gord, Gord Gray, who is Instagram's brand development lead for Europe. He advises commercial partners on best practices in advertising uh, and how Instagram can help to build an overall brand equity. Over the past 20 years, uh, Gord has developed an international career working with the world's leading brands in marketing, strategy and communications. And a fun fact about Gord, he's lived in eight countries and he has two gold I thought he was going to say medals, but it's not, it's fish. Goldfish, <laughs> uh, Sam and Megan. So uh, please give my panel a warm welcome. Thank you. Right, uh, Gord, we'll kick off with you. Um, let's pick up on the trend of contextual commerce. So in short, being able to, uh, to, 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 to browse and buy within the same platform in a frictionless experience. Why are social apps like Instagram becoming more focused on e-commerce because some people may find it a bit intrusive or irritating when they're looking at their friends holiday photos and they're you know given something by this um, is it really what users want um, we did have a lot of attention this year because we did launch in, in spring uh, the ability for brands to tag their products and the ability for people to go and actually con connect through to a website to be able to buy something. And the background to that was that what's interesting about Instagram is why people are on Instagram. And the, the reason that Instagram has become so uh, popular around the world is this idea about connecting with your passions through images and video. So that's why people are on the platform, the billion users that we've got. But what's also interesting is of the billion, 80% follow a business. I mean, if you think about that, that is a high number. 80% of users that are wanting to connect with businesses. And we were hearing over the last several years that we weren't making it that easy. You know, you'd see in your feed something that you discovered, something from a business, you think, wow, that's cool. We weren't making it that easy to connect with that, that uh, actual product you would have to, some people would screenshot it, you'd then click maybe to the website from the business's handle and you'd have to try to search for it. And, and we were hearing from the users as well as businesses that this is something that, that we could do, be better at. So that's the history of then why we decided to, to test the, ability, to the, the brands that can tag uh, images with product price points or pricing and then actually link through and then be able to actually find the product on the website. And, and it, it was a test because like anything you can imagine, Instagram, we will test before we launch something. And we were seeing that the take up really strong. We were hearing from businesses that this was making a difference on their account of people actually buying. Now we've got something like 90 million people are tapping on those tags every month when we expanded it uh, globally. And then since last spring, when we launched it, we've continued to add features. You can now tag products and stories. We added the ability to uh, to uh, have a shopping channel in, in Explore, so you can go to your Explore, that little magnifying glass, and look for brands and businesses mm. that have got shopping enabled. So the, to answer that first question was like, well, why? It's because of listening to our users about what they actually wanted to do on Instagram. I'd, I'd like to bring in um, Dan on that one, because um, do you think that the evolution that we've seen in other countries where people can do that whole process within one platform is going to going to expand or do you think that that works say for example with WeChat in China but may not translate elsewhere I I think it would translate elsewhere but I think it I mean Gordon knows more than I do as to whether that is actually going to happen or not this year but I think there's definitely 
a lot of scope for it to happen. I think there's definitely a lot of people. I mean, if you spend a lot of time in Instagram, you will see it is just a complete world. All human life is there. People get so passionate about, about different things. Um, it definitely has a lot of influence over um, you know, a lot of purchase decisions. And so I think the, the natural step would be to take the friction out. So as Gord said, you can't actually buy things on Instagram, but you can click through to places where you can. But I think if you could actually, if I put my card details in and my address and I could just you know, treat it like Amazon, then, then I think a lot of people would actually do that. But obviously I have no idea if, if or when that is, that is going to happen. But I, my feeling is, my gut instinct is, that if they did introduce it, a lot of people would take them up on it. I mean, I suppose the, um, the, the you know the, the the point that's made in the report is um, at the moment you have sites like like Amazon and eBay where you can go and you can specifically search for something. Yes. The the idea of um, serendipitously stumbling upon something when you're browsing for inspiration and being able to do that whole thing within one app or one on one platform creates a frictionless process that that streamlines the whole. Yes, thing. totally. Yes, and I mean, and there've always been workarounds on Instagram. So you had people like vintage shops in very early days saying, "Here's something we've just got in stock. If you want to buy it, then drop us a line or something." And so you've always had, and then and then you just PayPal people the money and things. So you've always had those workarounds, but it's just about being able to make the process as simple as possible. So to remove the workarounds, to remove the third-party companies, and then to keep it all sort of within the platform. And I think, I think one of the reasons why this has happened um, in China is that China really leapfrogged the desktop stage. They went straight to mobile. So most people in China, the mobile connection was the first connection they ever had, the first, their first use of the internet. And so there was no thing of, well, I can find this on my phone and I'll make a note of it. And then when I get home in the evening or when I get to work, I'll go into my, I'll go into my laptop and I'll buy it there. It was just, you know, it's the simplest thing. And so I think China's, in a lot of Chinese um, sites, there's a much simpler process, which which sort of makes things easier. Um, Sean, can I bring you in on um, on this? I mean, the the trends report last year, uh, there was a, a, a prediction of a, of, of a growth in Chinese influence, um, especially over social apps. That's where it seems most prevalent. Um, where, uh, as, as we heard from Dan, e-commerce, gaming have been way ahead of, 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 of Western counterparts. Um, why do you think that is? You know, do it, is it the, the philosophy uh, of the Chinese? Is it the, is it the uh, connectivity that they have there? What is it that gives them that edge? <coughs> well, you know, I think we're seeing cultural change being driven from different parts of the, the globe these days, aren't they? You know, this, is, this is the global economy uh, and, and uh, a change in, I guess, where new ideas and innovation are, are, are coming from. I think it's been really clear for, you know, for many years. In fact, I was part of a panel at Cannes in 2013 where we were talking about what the West can learn from the Chinese middle class. And it was really clear there that the way that categories worked were, were going to change because the, 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 the spending power and influence of the Chinese middle class consumer would force brands to change the way that they're building consumer experiences. So I think, I think it's, no, it's no surprise that the, that the value of the, of the Chinese spending dollar is influencing the way that brands see their global footprint. And, and obviously the, the experience that lots of Western luxury brands had you know, three or four years ago with, with, uh, with social commerce in China has brought some of that thinking back to the UK, and you can kind of see, I guess, at Burberry on Regent Street, you know, the work that they did to digitise their whole offering, you know, in part, I think, sprang from understanding the early adopting Chinese consumers, you know, desire for a luxury experience that was perhaps different to the the sort of mores of the way that those brands had been had been built in the West beforehand. So, you know, I think we in the West should expect lots of kind of change driven by new people who are more valuable to brands and kind of categories that we traditionally have, have, have owned. And, uh, you know, we need to be, to be open and, and embrace that, that kind of change. Alex, is there, is there any scope for Spotify, for example, to, um, to, to, to make something of the, the contextual commerce opportunities? Or is that something that, you, you know, is not featuring in your plans? Yes, to a degree. Um, obviously, uh, I'll talk about this more in a minute. Um, but contextualization and personalization is obviously sort of the, the secret source behind the Spotify platform. 
And increasingly what we're starting to see is now we're using some of this, uh, this data or our music intelligence to actually, um, to actually work with artists actually to develop um, almost unique fan-first experiences which can include live events but also can include merchandise and ticketing and pre-sale codes as well. So it is something we're looking at. It's, it's primarily at the moment just focused on contextual music-based commerce and things that you would um, naturally assume such as ticketing and um, yeah, I guess clothing, merchandise as it relates to the artists as well. I just want to move on to one of the other trends, uh, Alex, and we'll stay with, stay with you for this one. And it's uh, the, the targeting post GDPR after the general data protection regulations came and make it much harder for brands to target specific audiences. And so context uh, becomes a more crucial way of getting the right message in front of the right people at the right time. That has forced advertisers to refocus on how they engage audiences. What Spotify's approach to still targeting the right people with the right message and the right product and the right advert, but staying within the guidelines of GDPR? Yeah, well, actually Spotify is predominantly an in-app environment. So, you know, just to, to level set, we don't actually use cookies. So we do have to look at methods of targeting that try and either fit into or um, improve the user experience. So one thing, just as a starting point, we actually market to the people behind the devices, not just the device itself. So that sort of first party data gives us a, an understanding of real registered people um, as they soundtrack their day, whether that's for the music they listen to, the playlists that they stream or curate. And increasingly they're being curated to accompany different moods, mindsets, or moments as well. From the macro moments as driving or working out to the more micro moments like sleeping. Um, but it's increasing, it's from that data, it's how do we take insights and intelligence to help inform targeting, but also shape the development and serve the contextual relevant messaging, communication and content in relevant moments as well. And I guess another interesting development that we're seeing is that communities are, in, within music-based streaming, communities are being built around a music genres, but also these contexts and moments but I think the growth of spoken word as well through podcasting could actually start to add an, another depth to the layer of personalization and targeting. Because on Spotify, we're seeing people increasingly inspired to discover micro communities that are built around common interests, such as crazily wine enthusiasts who like crime, <laughs> um, knitting enthusiasts who like comedy. There's a podcast called Humblebee. There's a, a podcast called Wine and Crime. So, the actual personalised, contextual, targeted opportunities there offer great potential. And just to, to round out this, I think mean, context, to your point, and personalisation is really important to us as a business. It, a, it improves the user experience, but it earns the loyalty of our, our fans and also their trust. And I feel that trust, people inherently trust if they feel that they're understood. And when you think about music and podcasting, these are innately personal choices. So we have to deploy the data in a respectful way that personalises their experiences, but also safeguards their information. And I think fundamentally that level of trust, that depth of engagement, obviously it can only be a positive thing for brands as well on the platform. Um, Dan, uh, j yes. just to bring you in on this, um, if, you know, if, if you were dealing with a brand, if, you were, you know, if, a, if, a, if, if a, a company came to you and said, look, we, we no longer feel happy using the database of email addresses we have to send messages to people, a lot of them haven't opted in, how do we, how do we find the, the, the right people to target based on context? What would you advise them on a practical level is the best way to do that, in, say, in the coming 12 months? I think it's about trying to understand who the customers are, who, who the audience is you're, you're trying to address, and then also trying to understand the sorts of things that they do, the sorts of situations that they would, they would be thinking about the brand or the brand would be able to talk to them in. We were having a discussion prior to going out and doing a workshop based around the trends. We, we just started laughing because it was, you know, we're going back to where we were 20 years ago in that <coughs> people like this also like this, so there's lots of content around this. It's almost like um, looking at a magazine rack and thinking, well, we know people who like fishing also like such and such, and then, you know, we know people who do such and such also buy cars because they need to drive to get there. So it's about those sorts of things, forming partnerships, <coughs> but then also what wasn't available 20 years ago is you now have all sorts of tools where you can target based on the weather, time of day, you can have trigger points. 
So I think it's really about understanding who the audience is and then trying to understand which technologies give you access to that data. Um, I mean, you know, I, in the report I talked about um, some of the digital content optimization companies which can effectively produce you know, millions of different combinations of a video ad based on approximate location like the city somebody's in, time of day, what they're close to, those sorts of things. Also, um, we've had, so one of the things I do when I think about writing the report is I look to see what sort of new interesting startups are out there and what common themes they have between them and obviously digital content, content optimization was one of those. Uh, but another one who we're hearing a lot of is people who have um, SDK, so code in lots and lots of other apps and that's able to that's able to give them information about roughly where people are at different times of day and then you can use that in targeting uh, you know but obviously in a totally GDPR compliant way so there's, there's lots of things you can still do and I think a lot of people are very scared of GDPR and I think it has affected some businesses but what it's also driven is creativity in trying to think of solutions to the problems and new ways and new ways of using data. Sean, do you think that we've moved away from an era where content is king to now context being the only thing that matters? <coughs> I mean, it's interesting listening to what Dan has to say because, you know, it, it feels to me that over the last 10 years we've sort of abandoned some, you know, some very important principles about un understanding that the same person isn't the same person all of the time. You know, you can be a mother, a runner, you know, um, a high achieving businesswoman, et cetera, et cetera. People have kind of multiple facets to their life and personality. And just because you can reach that person as an impression at any point in time, doesn't, A, doesn't mean you, you should, and B, doesn't mean that you should forget the importance of, you know, modality moments and, and context. And I think, I'm kind of, uh, I'm of the opinion that we've, you know, regardless of GDPR, it's interesting to see fines being meted out this week. So it's going to be a, there's going to be an ongoing war of attrition between. It's, it's a really interesting point you make because uh, for those of you who may, may not be aware, France, uh, the Data Protection Office has just fined Google 50 yeah. million euros as a test case, really, yeah. for the new GDPR but can, for not getting enough. But interestingly, for offences allegedly set. committed in Ireland as well. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting that this is going to kind of bump around bump around the European Union. But I think we should be a little bit more worried about untargeting. You know, so uh, brands are built in the collective public consciousness. People often buy things because of what they say about them to other people. We've never been able to target, regardless of the specifics of G GDPR, we've never been better at targeting. But we're spending, in, in my view, uh, a disproportionate amount of time worrying about it and sometimes neglecting other things that are happening on a, on a consumer journey, like is my, is my brand being understood you know, by, the, by the public at large? You know, am, I, am I connecting with the right numbers of people to help them understand why my products has got kind of great benefits? Um, so I feel like we're kind of neglecting some aspects of brand building because we're spending so much time talking about this stuff. And I think everything's required in balance. Sometimes you need to go big and talk to everybody. Sometimes you need to pinpoint that career woman at a career woman modal point. Um, and I do think we need to take a bit of a, bit of a step back. And of, of course, context is really important. Of course, content in context is really, really important. But at the moment, it feels to me that we're not having enough conversations about that kind of stuff. And, you know, it, 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 you know the, the threat is to, you know, big established brands um, to kind of take their eye off, off, off that ball, I think. Gord, I want to bring you in on this uh, briefly um, on a slightly personal question because, um, I mean, with Instagram, um, often people say to me, do you know, it's really scary. I was talking about something in conversation and then pop popped an advert in my Instagram feed. It happened to me the other day. I was talking to a friend about Peloton and she sent me a screenshot. She said, you'll never guess what popped up. Just up. So how does Instagram deal with the targeting and the context issue in, uh, in yeah, the, the, sorry, the targeting post GDPR? Uh, how, does it, how does it keep getting the right thing in front of the right people that they'll be interested in, but staying within the GDPR limitations? Well, 
I'm sorry to hear about your Peloton retarget. I can, I can guarantee. Well, it, no, no, no need to apologize. I, mean, I may sign up. You never know. It may have worked. I can but. guarantee we're not listening, and there's no way we have that ability okay. to do that. But I, what I can say is that uh, obviously, with on Instagram, the way you build up your profile over time, and the way that you are experiencing the platform. Of course, we're learning about what matters to you, and then some. And the advertising that we are. Uh, sharing, we, we are connected with Facebook and the same targeting capabilities that Facebook has, the same target capability that uh, Instagram has. What's really interesting just working at Instagram is that what I find so fascinating is just how the system will learn based on, on what you're experiencing. And if you're not happy with something, we have that ability on every single ad, you know, the three little dots on, your, on, a, on the profile, you can say, don't show me this. And the system will learn, and it will not show you ads like that again. And I think that's a relatively unique thing in the digital space to be able to do that versus other forms of media, that ability of, of sort of helping outdoor print or, or, or something learn is not, is not possible. So that ability that we allow people to communicate back to us about what matters to them is how we continue to learn. Because we, we, at the end of the day, our, our whole philosophy is we want you to enjoy your experience on Instagram. So how can we help and how can we make that, uh, make that work? I'm going to move on to the next topic, um, uh, staying with you, Gordon. Alex, I'll come to, to you on this one next, so um, have some thoughts ready. Um, the, the overarching theme of the Trends Report is 5G connectivity and the fact that it's going to be, we're promised, 20 times faster than 4G. You'll be able to download, to give you an example, a film that would have taken you 26 hours 10 years ago, four seconds, full HD two-hour feature film four seconds. That creates huge potential, huge opportunities, but also that creates greater expectations and uh, the kind of experience people will want from the platforms and the apps that they use. If it means, uh, for example, greater use of augmented reality, virtual reality, those kinds of technologies, um, what, does, what does Instagram do to, to, to make the most of those new forms? Um, to get away from, say, simple rectangular images that may look quite flat and, and, and outdated before long? Well, it's, it's an interesting question with the whole uh, increase in bandwidth and increase in speed. What is the, the user behavior on all of these different uh, surfaces like Instagram? And I think like um, Alex had mentioned earlier, the, the thing that, that uh, an app like Instagram has is always just listening to the community and seeing what the community does. So what we've seen over time is, yes, there's been a massive increase in video. And video is a core part of your people's experience on Instagram. It is no longer only square or portrait uh, images. Even something like stories, where I'm, I'm assuming many of you here use Instagram, also now use stories. 50% of all uh, stories are video. Like that is a relatively high percentage for something 50, was like- Was it one five? 50. Five zero. Oh, five zero, 50%. Five zero, five, can right, you believe okay, it? 50% okay, yeah. of stories are video. So, <laughs> so people are posting a lot of video in stories. So we of course look at that, we look at what people are doing. As you also probably know, earlier this year, uh, or earlier last year, I should say, last August, we launched IGTV, and that was the ability to post longer form video than just 15 seconds, which is what the limit is on stories, but full screen, vertical video that is, is much longer that uh, up, to, up to an hour in terms of content. And what, what we, we were doing by experimenting with that was to understand uh, how people would, re would behave with this ability to post longer and more screen vertical video. And like that relates back to this idea about bandwidth and people spending more time on their phone and wanting to experience not only images, uh, but also the, the idea of video. And I, I think it's, it's, it's also interesting for an app with a, the, the billion users that are all over the world. Not everybody has that, uh, that real high speed uh, broadband capability. So the experience of how people will use the platform will depend a lot on the environment that you're in. So even though you're saying, is, is our image is going to become boring? I mean, I don't, I don't really think that's the case. It really, it really does depend on where you are in the world and how your experience of Instagram is. And that will just continue to evolve as things like broadband and speed evolves. OK. Alex, how does, uh, how does Spotify plan to make the most of the expanded connectivity? Well, if you think about uh, audio, uh, for a second. I think um, with increased connectivity, I mean, audio is becoming increasingly more accessible 
and more ubiquitous. I think if you just even look at Spotify, Spotify is accessible on over 300 devices across more than 50 partners just today. And I think audio's got that innate ability to coexist both in screen-based and screenless environments and technologies. And I think that last point regarding screenless environments is interesting. Because it goes back, it does enable us to access different moments that perhaps visual media cannot. I think if you think about showering or running or driving, and if you have to <coughs> land on the last uh, context, the key use case for audio is in car. And it's probably one of the most powerful connected devices that people use. And if you think about the, uh, the next generation of vehicles that are now being built, a lot of those entertainment systems will be powered by 5G. So if you think about what that means for the audio experience and listening experience in the car in terms of instant playback, um, the ability to personalise programme based on the people, based on the, the vehicle, based on navigation, and also interestingly probably is uh, the voice enabled technology that these vehicles will bring, which brings in a, a whole new level of engagement that probably doesn't exist with audio today, enables a more frictionless and seamless listening experience, but I think also potentially for brands it enables additional communication opportunities as well, in what's traditionally been a very lean back medium becomes a, more of a lean in medium. So understanding how to adapt your strategies to accommodate these new communication and engagement opportunities is interesting for us all to tackle together moving forward. And just at this point to say, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, we have a Twitter feed that's uh, uh, tweeting out choice highlights of the conversation. If you want to follow that, uh, just look for at Cara Global. If you want to join the conversation, use hashtag 2019 trends. Um, we'll come to audience questions um, in a moment, uh, but I just want to pick up on another of the trends in the report, design from data. So uh, in brief, this is the idea that, for example, like Amazon's four-star store, where it chooses which products to make available in the physical store based on ratings that users have given for what they've bought online. It only will stock things that have been rated four-star or above. A, 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 very clear example of using data not just to inform the advertising and the, uh, the, the marketing message, but feeding it back into the product offering as well. Um, Dan, question for you. If it's all very well for a company like Amazon to do that because it has all that data from its customers, how do brands that don't necessarily have that data themselves, where perhaps they operate through third-party platforms, how do they use data for design? Thanks. So um, I think data for design is really sort of a really strange trend in that with a lot of the trends, um, the, the brands, you know, the startups, the disruptors are best placed to take advantage of them because they don't have <coughs> old legacy systems. With this, with this trend, the point is that um, the brands best place to take advantage are ones like Amazon or ones like Spotify or ones who have huge, you know, relationships with those companies who can actually access that data. But what, um, but what new companies can do is, is like the company I highlight in the report, um, uh, it's an American Chinese startup called Choosy. What they do is they look at Instagram comments and they, don't, they look to see what influencers are wearing, they look to see what comments there are, and if lots of people are saying, where can I buy that, I'd love one of those, then they can actually literally produce something that looks quite similar to that within a week or so. And I think there's loads of things like Instagram comments that aren't locked down, that if you have the right systems for social listening, maybe if you use a bit of AI, if you try to work out what people say in things, you can actually get sense from that, that information. So I, this trend was actually going to go in to last year's or to the year before's rather, but I couldn't find that many examples of it. And one of the best examples I could find back then was in China, and it was about um, companies crunching through you know, thousands of reviews on, um, on Alibaba of what people had said about products and people said, we like this, but it doesn't have such and such. And so when they looked at that in enough numbers, they could see that there was a great demand for something. And I think there are lots of things around reviews, around comments, those, so platforms like Google Maps, I think Google Maps is, is extraordinary in terms of the number of people who review businesses. Some restaurants in London, you know, will have thousands of reviews on Google Maps. But I don't think anybody, apart from the owners, have been through and really crunched up the data and said, OK, what, what the aggregate of these reviews is saying is, is such and such. 
And so I think um, I think there are lots of lots of sources like that. Obviously, Twitter is all very open and very public. And so I think people are going to start to get a lot better at mining that sort of information. In the same way that um, there's a comedian who does a stage show where he just reads out stupid reviews or, or stupid comments on on YouTube videos. I saw somebody tweeting about he might be writing a book about um, owners' replies to one-star reviews on Google Maps and stuff. And there's, there's lots of that sort of stuff which is publicly available that I think brands can use. But it's about them trying to get the creativity and saying, well, this data's out there, but nobody's using it yet, so let's try and do something. Gord, on that point, to, to pick up on Dan's example there of uh, a startup app using people's comments that they've made on Instagram posts. Is Instagram relaxed about that? Or, or do you think you're missing a trick there by letting another brand, another uh, enterprise, uh, capitalize on that when the data is actually on your platform and you could use it perhaps, I don't know, partnering through Marketplace on Facebook to, to sell through there? Well, the, the idea about commenting, it's a good point about how people are using Instagram and this idea about, another uh, point that Alex has said earlier about this idea about community is because the commenting, like you, you mentioned, is a big, part of the experience of Instagram and the community that develops over that comment, the commenting. I mean, we're, we're not looking at everybody's profile and taking that, the, the comments and trying to do something with it. That's not really where we're focused. But what is interesting is how the experience of people's behavior on Instagram has evolved over time. The, the idea of just sharing images, filtering them, and then just going through your feed and experiencing just people's uh, images throughout the day and, and, and the, the community that developed around just t types of images was, has now evolved much more into this ability to message and comment back and then have people comment uh, to each other under maybe a business's post or business responding. And I do think that is only going to get bigger and bigger. And what we've seen in stories, I keep coming back to stories because that has been the biggest transformation that Instagram has gone on on the last um, year, year and a half, is the, the amount of comments that now take place in stories. A third of every, um, a third of businesses are receiving, uh, or a third of uh, stories, I should say, are receiving uh, messages from people on, uh, that are directly contacting them on stories. That is a very high percentage. You think 33% of every story is getting a direct message. That we've had comments and the ability to, ta to, uh, to send a message on feed for years and years and years, and it's not nearly that high. So what I would say is that the commenting, the direct messaging, and the ability for businesses to be able to respond to that and not see it as a kind of uh, annoying customer service extra add-on, but seeing it as a fundamental way of building the brand, I think will get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think that's a great point, this whole idea about the community that comes from that. Sean, sure. do you think um, we'll see a, a change in the way that, uh, that, that, that brands and, and, and uh, advertisers will operate in, in that new environment? <clears throat> well, I, I think this bleeds into uh, yeah, and another of the trends, which is around life being a service and, and service design. Because um, I think one of the most interesting <laughs> things that's happening at the moment is that brand owners that have data are trying to figure out how, you know, how they can improve the experience and extend the experience that is attached to their brand, as well as to make physically make new stuff. You know, I was just I was reading a really interesting paper from the business school at Stanford this morning to try and kind of sound intelligent here and kind of prep myself. And one of the <laughs> one of the one of the professors had said, you know, one of the biggest, most profound shifts in the economy and the economy of brand building that we're seeing at the moment is that everything ultimately will become a service and and a, and a subs model. You know, and I think that that's a it's a big threat. It's a big threat to some brands who can't figure out if you're a physical product what you can do to add value beyond the actual transaction. Because the danger but, is it becomes uh, like a utility. It becomes something mundane well, and routine, and they have to keep it special. Well, and well, well sure, and I think there's one, you know, there's one element of subscription models, you know, which is kind of life's too short to shop um, these days in some categories, and, and, and kind of people want to, want to kind of free themselves from the, you know, the <laughs> overwhelming choice that they have you know, and, and, and interact with brands that give a, a really sort of simple experience. Uh, and I think that presents a real kind of challenge to brands to be super simple. So incidentally, uh, another thing I was reading this morning, which is uh, a great report from a, a US agency called Siegel and Gale, the Brand Simplicity Report. And they do a big global report in which consumers rank 
the seamlessness and simplicity of the experience that that brands give them and, and of course they've got a, uh, a a correlation back to the increasing kind of stock value as all grand theorists have but you know Netflix is number one uh, Spotify is kind of number eight and it's really interesting that those kind of service brands are are not only building su sub sub successful subscriptions in their own right, but they're setting the tone and expectations for consumers. Where I think this gets even more interesting is if you're, if you're building a physical product and you want to be visible and relevant in the digital economy when you may not be purchased super frequently, you've got to figure out how you can create a v relevant value exchange with consumers that gives you the right to be visible in their lives and interact with them at the times you're, you're not being bought and maybe to monetize that relationship. So I think this is having really profound impact on brand building, the way we understand consumer journeys, the way we work with data, et cetera. You know, and I think Dan flags in the report that you can now buy a Nespresso machine for one pound as long as you sign up to one of the capsule resupply subscription services that range from 14 to 45 pounds. So I think that this is, you know, it's, it's really making marketers think about what their business model is. Uh, and I think it's very exciting for us because there are more opportunities for the, for the likes of, of ourselves to add value uh, to businesses. And I suppose what it does is it turns that, that traditional search for brand loyalty into an actual financial commitment and you have guaranteed yeah. income as a, as, a, as a product. But I think it also changes what you talk to consumers about. So, <clears throat> for instance, for, you know, for, for, for Nespresso, do they talk about the, uh, the, benef the product benefits of the machine or do they talk about the service benefits of being part of the Nespresso VIP club? I think an awful lot of this comes down to understanding your data, understanding the modality of your audience. And, you know, I think he, he or she who kind of wins in this world has mapped that consumer experience better and understands how to sequence the message of love the machine, great deal, membership of the, of the VIP club, etc. So, you know, I think exciting times and very big ramifications for us. I want to bring Alex in on this, because I suppose Spotify was, uh, was a, an early example of uh, getting people to switch from buying a one-off product, like a, be it a download or a CD, to, to subscribing and having access to the entire catalogue that was, was on offer. There's some really interesting examples of um, that being used by Spotify as a, as a, as a way of, of giving something back that's uh, tailor-made and special. I mean, the example I'm thinking of is the Metallica example, where they look at each city they're playing in, don't they, and then see what people are listening to there and curate the set list so that they almost give a bespoke concert according to which tracks are most popular wherever they're going. Yeah, yeah there's, um, there's a lot of uh, different value exchanges that happen on the platform, but I'll go back to another trend as well to go between the two. When you think about design from data, that's all very well, but the most important thing fundamentally is the, the insights that you extract from that data. Um, and that's what we call our, I said before, our streaming intelligence. And that really, that actually guides or informs the direction as to how we work with artists, how we think about marketing, how we work with brands, but also how we inform the product um, development and the product experience. And that's the thing that we've uh, continued focused on to sort of think about stickiness of engagement. And if you think about, back to thinking about the personalized content experiences, it's actually, we're lucky that uh, our product offers two elements that are fundamental to a lot of people's well-being, and that's music and discovery. So we're really focused on building experiences that actually facilitate discovery and enjoyable experiences. You think about Discover Weekly is one, in which obviously we, we launch over 200 million unique playlists um, to our users every Monday. Other more unique one-off experiences could be like the time capsule, which is quite poignant, surprising. We're actually using the streaming intelligence to actually develop a personalized playlist of 30 tracks from your your teens and your 20s. So that is all how we use sort of data to drive design. But what fundamentally I think is most important and where creativity works best is when you infuse the, the algorithms with people, the input of people. Um, and it's something we call uh, Spotify algatorial, where we take our algorithmic based recommendations and then they are filtered and uh, handpicked by a team of human curators. And these human curators all have like a, uh, a specialist knowledge of a particular music genre, but also the lifestyle and culture associated with that genre. And then we put these curators in different markets throughout the world. 
And so they can actually make sure that the culture has been reflected in the content that we're curating. So you actually end up with this, um, and actually that's been used to inform sort of owned and operated experiences like Viva Latino, um, Rap Caviar in the US, and Hot Country in the US, sort of our operated franchises. But, and this becomes really interesting, you get a nice blend of human knowledge, intuition, and the data together. And we're increasingly thinking about how we use, I'll go back to something I talked about earlier, the fans first experience. Again, that's using working with artists to use this music intelligence to identify a core group of fans in a location and develop unique and exclusive experiences for them. And I think we recently did a laugh, we did a, um, and I'm trying to remember what it's called, in New York recently, we did a Ginger Edman baking session with Ed Sheeran and, and a core group of his fans in New York. Um, so I think for brands, it's what we want to really think about is working with agencies like Cara and, and their brands to think how do we use those, that streaming intelligence to build personalised solutions that tap into music and discovery as well. So want, um, just to get, we'll come to, to audience questions, I promise we'll come to audience questions in just a moment. Just um, to sort of take the temperature of the room, uh, just have a show of hands, how many, how many of you here in the room have either done a total digital detox at some point over the last 12 months or, or deliberately tried to cut back on the amount of time you spend online? Okay, so probably about two thirds of the room maybe. Uh, that feeds into almost a, a counter trend if you like because it's all very well having the connectivity, the faster speeds, but if the zeitgeist is people realizing that they're spending too much time online and they want to invest more in their, you know, their, their, their physical spaces around them, seeing friends face to face and get away from the online thing. How do brands deal with the fact that people may not be wanting to engage and spend as much time online? Dan. Um, I think brands need to really focus on the most essential places that, that they try to communicate with people. So I think, I mean, I've, I've been doing digital detox, I use the Hold app and it, it prevents me from using my phone for quite a lot of the day which actually adds to my productivity which is good. And you get rewards for doing that. And you get rewards yeah. for doing it. But what I, what I find is that um, I use fewer different apps and I use apps more intensively as a result of it. So I still use Twitter, I still use Insta, I still use Facebook, I still use Gmail, etc. But I use them sort of much more intensively and maybe some of the other ones that I wasn't that interested in I haven't opened you know, haven't opened for a couple of months or something. So I think, I think the main thing is um, trying to work out what are the most essential places that you should be and maybe trying to concentrate and be strong in those ones and be relatively invisible in the other ones. Sean, how do you advise brands? Um, <coughs> well, well uh, you know, I, I, uh, during my own, uh, I'm, I'm not doing an official detox, but I'll give you an example of, uh, of, a, of a detox moment for me, which is going running. Um, you know, but when I go running, I love to listen to podcasts because podcasts help me run further. And then there are some brands that appear in those podcasts. Interestingly, I can remember all of them, uh, as opposed to some in other in other places uh, that I've seen. Um, uh, you know, and they kind of fit into the, they kind of fit into the experience. So, you know, I, I I think this is not not always an either or. It, it's it's kind of what are, what 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 do we mean by digital time? Because you know. Audio, audio accompaniment to moments is kind of different to like my kids gazing at screens all the time and kind of driving me mad and putting kind of phones in the kind of, in the kind of phone bin. Um, so I, I, you know, I think it's, it's, not a one size, it's not a one size fits all, first of all. Uh, secondly, I think we need to recognize that the majority of brand experience in total in most categories is still built offline. You know, it's conversations about brands, it's packaging, it's TV, it's posters. And, and I think it's incumbent on us to figure out what is a rounded, balanced solution for a brand. So if they are suffering from ad blocking, if they are suffering from detoxing, they're not completely disappearing from, uh, from relevant places. But I think this is also a question of our times. I was kind of remembering when I was a kid, we didn't have a TV because my mum and dad sort of disapproved of TV and thought it was a corrupting influence. We were then banned from watching ITV because they didn't approve of ads. And now when I go home to my parents' house in Leeds, they're sitting gazing at the TV all day watching politics channels. And, uh, you know, they need a TV detox. So I, I, I think we just need to put this in context. If you're a 12-year-old kid, you'd, think, you'd be thinking, why do I need a detox? This is just, this is just life. Um, um, 
Right. Uh, questions from the floor. Anything on the trends report? We've covered, uh, I'd say, probably well, more than half the, uh, of the trends mentioned in the report. Of course, there are some others as well. Um, but we have this, uh, this wealth of experience on the panel. Any questions from the floor on anything you've heard or anything you'd like to hear a little bit more about? Yes. Hi. Um, just on digital detox, actually, I was just interested because YouTube have their take a break feature. Are Instagram and Spotify doing anything in particular? Is it something that you're really cognizant of and worried about or not so much? Um, nothing specific, but I, I'd build on what Sean said. I think um, audio has that ability, I think, to flex the different con consumer needs and states. So I think that it can actually accompany um, any sort of digital or screen-based detox. And if you think, just to build on what Sean said again, about the different roles of music and podcast in people's lives, I think a lot of people generally need music for emotional sustenance or mood regulation or podcasting for learning or education or inspiration. So I think there should be a more considered focus about how we um, build content or experiences to support the rational and emotional well-being of people. And I think with, with technology is going to help that as well. If you think even just with wearables as well, to think about all the different health metrics you could get from uh, wearables and being able to accompany that with different beats per minutes within your playlists or different mood-based playlists or the appropriate podcast content to support that as well. So I think there are some interesting opportunities that, that we could think about with the right brands and agencies as well. And uh, yes, on, from an Instagram perspective, we do take that whole idea about well-being and just what is your experience on Instagram and can we do more really, really seriously. We have a team that are working on that and I'm not sure if people have noticed we have actually launched something called Time Spent. It's found in your settings and you can go there and you can check how long you've been on the, on the platform. And it's really interesting, like, like uh, what we're hearing here is just everyone has a little bit of a different opinion about what, what their experience is. So it's not as if we can say, you should spend only this amount of time on Instagram and that's right for you. It's more for letting people to, to, to decide themselves what the amount of time they feel is right for them. But this time spent is quite useful. I find it fascinating. I go on it uh, all the time and I check like, oh, I was on Instagram this amount this day and this amount that day. And you can put a little uh, signal that says, uh, if you want to set a time that it will send you a little alarm to say, oh, you've been on it this amount of time. So that's the kind of thing we're testing. But I, we at Instagram also agree there's much, much more we can do in this space. We're all learning like what actually makes sense. Like I find listening to music completely is a great way of actually de almost detoxing from other things. I listen to interestingly run our podcasts on my runs as well. So it's funny how we all have a little bit of a personal feeling about what it actually means to to detox and from what. So that's something that we've, like I mentioned, we've got a team that are actually taking it very seriously and know that we, there's a lot more that we can do. Uh, any more in the room? Any more questions? Uh, yes, just <coughs> in that corner there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's been really interesting. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to know if there was any demographics that are kind of particularly affected by these trends. So any kind of, is it millennials that will be particularly affected or is it kind of baby boomers is there? Um, I think it's potentially everybody. I said, when, I, when I set out to write the report, I don't think about any particular audience. And I know I have a natural skew, obviously, to write about the West, and Europe, and the US. Um, but I definitely don't think I have a natural skew to only write about things which affect teenagers or only write about things. I think um, one, of the, one of the things, I mean, some of the companies which I've written about in the trends are quite quite interesting so TikTok for example is pretty much unknown I think to anybody over about the age of 22 or 24 um, so I think there's some really interesting sort of effects of how different uh, different ages look at things and look at things in different ways but I definitely don't yeah I, I would I would definitely hope that they're relevant to everybody <coughs> have another question down oh uh yeah. I was just going to say, for those of us who are over 24, <laughs> what is yeah. TikTok? And yeah. I guess if it was so, it's mentioned in the report as the most popular or like the biggest app of 2018. What about it did that? And what other existing social apps that people over 24 might use, like Insta and Facebook and Snapchat, take from that? Um, well, I think, so, so the reason I wrote about it was I think that the time is right in that it's purely video based. There's 
there is search on it, but I think most people just, just follow the stream. Um, and I think also it's, it's very easy to create. And so it's sort of designed for fast connectivity and for sophisticated devices. But I mean, but what, sorry, what is, is it sort of, uh, is this the one where people mime along to yeah. Yes, it, it, was it, called called music, called it was called Musical.ly. It was very, very big amongst uh, primary school kids about three years ago where I live in Southwest London. So they must be like uber trendsetters. <laughs> But we had, uh, I hope I'm not revealing any confidences, we had them in for a chat a few days ago and, you know, millions of monthly active users in the UK and across Europe and in the States. So, you know, very big. Uh, do we have any, any other questions? Just another, yeah, in the, in the middle, uh, in blue. Yeah. yeah. And then if you pass it on to sure. person next to you. Yeah, one of the things that we're seeing sort of at a more macro level is um, you know, the rise of uh, sort of more populist politics, uh, Trump, etc. Um, and something we've written about um, as an agency is a decline in trust in brands and institutions and organisations. Um, and I just wonder what uh, the panel think about um, what the impact of that sort of decrease in trust, um, awareness of fake news, awareness of data um, has on, on the trends that we're talking about. Who wants to kick off with that one? Uh, thanks, thanks for the question. Well, no, I think, <laughs> Sean, do you want I'd, to uh, kick us off with that? I actually think um, there's a big opportunity for, for yeah. brands, uh, as you know, kind of collectively to elevate their trust levels in a world where it's plummeting in, in institutions um, by, be, by adding value to life. And I think many of the things that we've kind of talked about, which is you know, judicious use of data, thinking about service design principles, et cetera, and, and kind of thinking about what your role and purpose in a, in a low-trust society is can help, can help brand owners. Because I think you know, in uncharted waters, people are looking for um, solid things that are useful to, to, kind of, to kind of grab onto. And I think if you're a, if you're a brand owner, um, you know, genuinely trying to engineer experiences that are kind of valuable, genuinely listening to people through what they tell you implicitly or explicitly, um, you know, and, and kind of thinking about uh, how, you, uh, how, how you fit together all of the things that you do, whether they be kind of CSR campaigns or, you know, or, or kind of product driven activities, there is an opportunity to be seen as, you know, a, uh, a, a, a trusted friend to people. Uh, in, diffi in difficult times, you know. So I think that politics is, uh, you know, pol 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 the threat to politics, you know, is an is an opportunity for brands. But again, I think kind of being straight talking uh, with with people and really focusing on trying to understand when you've got permission to talk to people and about what is is kind of super important, rather than kind of going back to that GDPR point, which is just hitting people because they're an impact and you can. Uh, so that'd be my take on it. Actually, big opportunities. Um, we've got time for one last question there in the middle. Yeah. Um, Dan, you said that you've uh, naturally got skew to writing about Europe, the US, uh, and probably China as well. Are there any other parts of the world where you think that these trends are particularly relevant? Again, I think the trends are pretty. I mean, I hope they're pretty global, but I do. I do have to acknowledge that um, I. I really only speak English and I really can only follow news about these countries and, and monitor stories about these countries. But I think, I think the principles of the trends, I mean, a lot of the trends are driven by things like human nature in terms of simplicity with, you know, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time on this particular site or app. Why do I have to go to another site or app to actually buy something? So I think, I think a lot of the trends are driven by things like simplicity and people just wanting to have natural human behavior, which is relatively universal. Um, just before we wrap up, um, there are 10 trends in the report. I'm going to ask each of you to give us what you think is the trend over the coming year that's going to be the most disruptive. What's going to change our lives the <laughs> most of all the 10 that we've identified? So they're on the wall behind you. You see most of them there. Uh, the only ones you can't see, just better. digital detox, expanding connectivity, and by invitation, uh, the rest you can see there. Uh, uh, who's going to who's going to kick us off with it? Alex, I'll start with you. <laughs> um, I think if we uh, if we're just going to focus on this room and, and our industry, I do think the um, the sort of post GDPR world. Um, I think as increasingly agencies and brands adapt to different 
um, methods or approaches to targeting, understanding um, are they contributing to the bottom line, are they delivering business outcomes for their, for their clients, as well as understanding you know, what types of messaging is working, what isn't working. So I think that that's going to be a, a somewhat disruptive learning experience that uh, we'll go through as an industry this year. Sure. Uh, well, I'm not going to pick the same one. I'll go, I'll go for the emergence of 5G. Now, we may, not, we may not see the full ramifications of it this year, but if you, if you think about how the world has changed, how the world of marketing has changed over the lifespan of 3 and then, and then 4G, you know, I think uh, brand owners who get in quick to try and understand what they, sh what they should change about what they make, um, how they build um, better, faster, more relevant experiences, maybe how they redesign their organization for a super fast kind of connected world will will kind of win out so you know the ramifications are going to uh, are going to spin out over the next couple of years but i think some of the early decisions that are made about kind of gearing up for faster deeper connectivity will will be you know positively disruptive for those that embrace it dan well i would say probably um, contextual commerce and that was the reason why I put it as the first trend because I thought it was the the most potentially the most disruptive but also probably the most engaging um, to have at the start of a start of a document um, but obviously I don't know whether that's going to happen Gord knows more about whether that's going to happen than <laughs> I do but what I what I would say in terms of um, in terms of probably the biggest in the long term apart from 5g would be designed from data because I think it's going to be I think data analytics is going to become much more important for, you know, for, for the main business of, of companies rather than just the media and the marketing. I think you know, people are just going to be redesigning products and, and creating new services based on what they're observing from data as a matter of course in, a, in the next few years. And finally, Gord. I can't believe you guys all took the ones that I was going to talk about. But what, what all, you can do, pick the same ones. You can gonna, pick the same ones. I will combine two of them just to make <laughs> things interesting. But it's the design from data combined with the, um, the increase in, in speed. Because I think what, what we find in Instagram is quite often businesses are a little behind the user experience. So I say this huge rise in video and this huge amount of people using stories. And businesses are always a little bit behind when our users are there. And we spend a lot of time talking to businesses saying, look, the consumer, the user is there, and you're sort of over here. So I think by more and more businesses understanding that the data that they can learn, even from their own experience on the platform and their own use of video, and they see that growth, that will allow them to, be, to, to create better content that will ultimately have better results. So things like just understanding how does video differ on a, on a mobile? Like that, that's something that I think is not necessarily a brand new trend, but it's something that the data tells us that we experience video different port uh, when we're looking at a portrait. We experience differently uh, video differently when it's uh, uh, within a, an app like Instagram. The amount of time we spend, we have to draw people in within the first split second. Videos might load more quickly. And that's something that businesses can can just get on the bus that the consumer is already on. So I think I am, I know, kind of spoiling the question by combining, but that's what I would say. <laughs> okay, um, and that brings us to the end uh, of this discussion on the 10 Trends 2019 report from uh, Karen. My thanks to uh, the whole panel, to Gord, to Dan, to Sean, to Alex. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Thank you for the questions uh, that we've had from you in the room. I should say uh, thank you to Laurie and Charlie who've organized today's panel uh, and given us plenty of, uh, of food for thought. Thank you to those of you watching on the Facebook Live page. If anyone would like to carry on the conversation, as I say, you can do that. The hashtag is uh, Trends2019, uh, the Twitter feed at Cara Global. Tag me in. I'd love to see uh, some of the conversations you're having. You'll find me on there at Ben M. Bland. Uh, that brings us to the end of the session. Thank you, everyone, very much for coming. Thank you.